Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome, and thank you for, for inviting me to speak here. So uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce you to the, to the uh, Super Lab. This is the Stanford University Power Electronics Research Laboratory. I just couldn't pass on the name. <laughs> it's a perfect name for a lab. But, uh, and this is, uh, as I guess every professor will say, it's uh, a lot of the work that my students have done, and literally they do all the work. And this is just a picture. If you are, if you are ever in Allen, uh, in the annex in uh, the room 217, you guys are welcome to take a peek. It's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, not, as, not as dirty as it looks right now. So um, what, what I want to tell you about is like the research work that we're doing in very high frequency power electronics. So as Arun said, uh, like power electronics for, I guess, historical reasons is just not sexy. It's uh, people considering it like it tends to be something that is easily commoditizable. It's uh, uh, you, you design things to have a function and at the end you realize that, ah, yeah, and you have to power them. And uh, sometimes the size and weight of the whole system that you want becomes dependent on how you're powering it. And power electronics in that regard has done a lot to try to reduce the size of, of the power supply so that we can have like a lot of portable, portable devices. Uh, all the power supplies have switches that operate at, uh, on and off to try to convert energy efficiently. And they typically operate in standard, standard power supplies in the frequencies that are in the few hundreds of kilohertz range. The power supply that we're trying to investigate in, in the super lab is uh, if we want to, to step, up, step up a notch, like about two or three orders of magnitude. We want to uh, operate with switches in the orders of uh, tens of megahertz to 100 megahertz. Because fundamentally, what we're trying to do is as we increase the frequency, we can reduce the size of the energy storage device, devices that we need, uh, essentially inductors and capacitors, and which today dominate the size, uh, the size and weight on a, in a power supply and in many, many appliances. Particularly, one of the reasons that I'm interested in this area is because as you go at higher and higher in frequencies, the inductor values that you need become so small that you can actually replace them with air core devices. That means just a piece of wire. Uh, that has uh, other, other benefits that, for example, what it means is uh, you can instead of having to manufacture an inductor, you can start thinking about using the traces of your printed circuit board to form that inductance. Uh, and actually, it, it actually is compelling, actually becomes better. But not only that, the, it also allows you to, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that, that we, you can start engineering your system such that the same traces uh, that uh, start taking other, other roles. Like they can become uh, EMI, EMI shields uh, or selective filters for, for, for electric power, et cetera. Also, at these frequencies, we can also do the, 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 uh, the capacitors also become so small that we can actually start implementing with nothing else but like two surfaces on the printed circuit board. So again, we're trying to, instead of having uh, adding components on a board that does nothing else but to, to be a connector. We actually want to become, uh, to transform it into a functional component. And I particularly, I'm interested in reducing topologies that allows you like efficient uh, lower uh, conversion, uh, power conversion. So this is a, a little bit of a cartoon of what we're trying to do. And the vertical axis is power density. Power density is the name of the game uh, uh, in, my, in my field. Power density is how small you can make a power supply. And that has a lot of implications in terms of uh, cost, weight, reliability, temperature. Uh, like power density is what you want. A lot of people say dollars for me. I, I think on power densities. And uh, uh, historically, in the past 20, 30, 40 years, in, uh, in the field, in power electronics, we've been increasing uh, the switching frequency, which is plotted on the, on the horizontal axis, such that as we go higher and higher in frequency, we achieve higher power densities. Uh, but at a frequency of around two, 200 kilohertz, uh, we start reaching a point of diminishing returns. Those diminishing returns happens because, unfortunately, uh, components are not ideal. So you start to have significant switching losses that uh, 
they just make things a little warmer, so you need to start derating things. You need to start adding hit sinks. You start need, need to start using uh, bigger components. Uh, uh, and that prevents you from achieve, achieving the same gains that you were, that you were uh, having before as you were increasing the frequency. But like if for some uh, operational reason you still need to go to higher frequencies, you find that as you approach a switching frequency of around one megahertz or two megahertz, you actually think it get really bad. And the reason is magnetic core losses. So when, when we have inductors and transformers in a power supply, we have a magnetic field that essentially is uh, alternate, like it's flowing through a magnetic structure, which essentially is comprised of a lot of uh, uh, magnetic domains that essentially are rotating against each other. So you can imagine that, that it produces a, 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 something like akin to friction that uh, essentially makes your transformer or your inductor gets hotter. That means that you need to derate the size of your converter uh, mo uh, a lot more. Usually means just make uh, reducing the power, the, the flux density in the magnetic material, which just means make it bigger. Then again, you reach this point in which not only is diminishing return, it actually things become bad. You cannot reduce the size of your power converter anymore. So uh, that's kind of like where things are. So like as part of my research, since I was doing my PhD, we were, uh, I've, I've been very interested in to figure out if, if there's a way to, to, to change things a bit. And it turns out there is. So for example, it also happens that at this frequency of around one or two megahertz, uh, you start seeing that the, the inductor values that you need become so small that you can actually implement it with an air core. So uh, the, the great advantage of doing an air core design is that now you do not have these core losses at all. Also, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in, 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 in the uh, literature, a lot of a wealth of information about how to design uh, resonant converters that like uh, essentially eliminate most of the switching loss. And uh, by switching to air core, you can essentially eliminate uh, magnetic loss. But there's a penalty, and the penalty is that you, uh, you got rid of your magnetic core. Uh, the, the reason we like to use magnetic cores and to make inductors is they allow you to pack a large inductance in a small, a small volume. So if you go to an air core, you lose that advantage. So it's not, a, uh, and, and that's why the curve, you can see that it goes down in power, in power density quite significantly. So it's just not enough to get to a point in which you, you can operate at higher frequency uh, uh, with air core. You actually have to go above like about two orders of magnitude to actually uh, require inductors that are still smaller and even smaller so that you can gain back the power density that you, got, that you lose by eliminating the magnetic core. But the big benefit though is that now there's nothing that stops you. You can just keep going, keep increasing in frequency. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you can eliminate the magnetic material so your power supply doesn't get hit by lightning. <laughs> so, uh, but, but like, so, so essentially that's what we want to do. We want to keep increasing in, in switching frequency to the point that we can uh, uh, achieve power densities that, that, are, that go well beyond what is currently achievable. But not only just for power density itself, it's like it turns out that like when we operate in this region, there's other opportunities for applications that we can uh, envision. So uh, again, uh, so for example, this is uh, one of the inductors that I was using when I was doing my PhD, and it shows an air core inductor that is this shape, uh, uh, it's a solenoid, solenoid air core inductor. And um, this is a field that actually a geometry means a lot. And, and it actually gets a, a lot of fun makes you think uh, in pretty figures. But uh, so in this solenoid, the magnetic field, like if you have magnetic field vision, you, you'll, you'll see that uh, most of, like the magnetic field is concentrating within the axis of the, of the, of, the, uh, of the solenoid, but then it has to return in an involving envelope that actually occupies a significant volume. Uh, <laughs> it does it very, very thin. I'll, I'll switch with this laser. Uh, 
So like, like it has to go in an involving, like the magnetic field has to form closed loops. So that it actually involves, a, 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 and that volume occupies a significant volume. So, uh, so if you put structures nearby that field, they disturb the magnetic field and, uh, and they can jeopardize the performance of your power supply. So like one way to overcome that is just a simply change in geometry. You can start making your inductors uh, uh, following a, a toroid because that way you're essentially forcing the magnetic flux to turn on itself and essentially confine it to be within the torus. And that actually has a very significant impact in, in the reduction of uh, uh, electromagnetic interference that a structure like this may generate. But like this structure uh, is, so, so this is an air core. The, the, the material inside is just plastic that we were just using for, for support. But this goes a long ways into helping you like uh, maintain the magnetic fields within the, with this, this structure. But like this is why things become more interesting when you switch to air core. Uh, even though this, this, is, this actually helps you a lot, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of empty spaces between turns. Those are just opportunities for, for magnetic flux to leak out, and uh, you generally don't want that. And also, like for example, if I ask one student to build one today, and like he builds one tomorrow, like the, the precision, the repeatability of the components is not that great, just, just be, by the structure itself. But uh, what, what I meant that like one of the advantages to switch to air core is that you can start implementing the same structure, just taking advantage of the structures that you can do on a printed circuit board to essentially do the same. And that's, that's actually turns out to be a very good idea, not only because uh, you actually get better performance, like you can see here that uh, the, the metal actually covers all the surface, like for the most part, so uh, except like when it's needed to, to, to keep separated turns. And that uh, like goes a long way into reducing those like leakage flux that can interact with our nearby structure. Uh, but this structure is also much cheaper because like if you can uh, reach a point in which you can essentially use your printer circuit board as a, as a component, you can just print them like making pancakes. It's, it's, it's very, very inexpensive. And we want to see what, uh, what we can do once we reach that point. But even though there's benefits to, for, for this, there's also, uh, this is not ideal, particularly if you uh, think about the current that flows through those turns. They actually have to go through sharp edges as they go to from the top to the top layer, then down the bottom layer, and defining the, the, the turns of the toroid. And like current usually don't like to follow, they don't like to follow like sharp edges. So we would like to see if we can do be better. So we're trying to figure out if, if, if we can exploit uh, all the 3D, advanced, 3D printing advances such that we can actually uh, uh, realize a better structure. So, uh, what, so that's kind of in the component level. So now in the converter level, I just want to show you a little bit what, uh, what we have done and we were doing. So this is out of uh, my, my doctorate, uh, my, my, my PhD. So it's a power supply that was uh, uh, probably, uh, I think it was like 250 watts for uh, 30 megahertz operation. So one of the converters that my students just built, uh, this is a, a structure that uses gallium nitride uh, semiconductors, it uses steroidal inductors, again, like hand wound, uh, are made by hand. Uh, this is a, a power supply that is very, very small, and it's about 100, 100 watts, uh, 100 watts of uh, RF power. Uh, but like you can see, in this case, we're trying to constrain to to, uh, to keep all the magnetic the magnetic flux to be within the torus. And then we have reached the point in which we're designing a similar structure, but with all the components, like all the inductors, were actually uh, formed using printed circuit boards. Right? This is a power supply that actually produces up to 1,000 watts of, uh, 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 of, of, of uh, power. And it's very, very compact. And it uses, non like most of the components is just a printed circuit board. Like, so right now, in, when you open a power supply, you see a electronic uh, uh, a fiberglass board, in which there's a lot of components on top of it. But the functionality of the, of the, of the board is nothing but a dumb connector. What we're trying to do is turn that into a specific components. And actually, uh, so what we want to take is a design that, that goes from, from, from this. 
to something that looks like this. Imagine that you have a printer circuit board that like uh, we can make like the technology is there to make multi-layer printer circuit boards, in which in the inner layers, we actually make all the, all the structures that form all the inductors and capacitors that uh, you require to make a power supply. So you don't have to place them. It's already in the printer circuit board structure. But because it's within the inner layers, you can actually make the top and bottom layer of the structure a full ground plane. Uh, that has the advantage that then the top and bottom layers become a Faraday shield to uh, shield from electromagnetic uh, interference inside and out. Uh, so, but like, so you, the only thing that you need to do is put a recess area so that you can put your semiconductors that then you can actually put the top, the top shield that also will serve the function of a heat sink. So uh, what I kind of like, the reason I like this approach is Essentially, it's like printing power converters. Like, uh, I believe that this can has, has the enormous potential that can significantly reduce the cost that it would take to make a power converter. Uh, what we can do with an uh, inexpensive power converter, that's what I'm going to try to show you next. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, like, we, we, even though we like this idea of using a, a printer circuit board to make converter, we want to see if we can exploit the 3D printing technology that uh, has been developed lately. So we decided to, can we generate these uh, air core inductors uh, uh, using a 3D printer? So we created uh, a model on the computer. We uh, printed, 3D printed in wax. And then we can either cast it or metalize it uh, to form a metallic structure that behaves like the inductor that we want. But it has the tremendous advantage that like now we can actually uh, have rounded, full, co like full complete surfaces. We can actually uh, uh, have very controlled shapes. And not only that, like the possibilities become endless. You can start making structures that you were not able to do or uh, using a printer circuit board, as I'll show you. So you next. Wrong way. So, but it turns out that like, when we start doing this, we discover like, that there's no software to make uh, 3D inductors yet. So we actually use like, the software that we're using to develop this uh, uh, converters, this structure. It's actually uh, a software, a free software. It's called OpenJSCAD. You can just go online and check it right now. And it's actually used to design cell phone cases. But like, it lets you, it, it, it lets you uh, es essentially uh, do some programming to, to, to actually code structures that like, now we're at the point in which we can only enter the number of turns and inner and outer diameters that we want, and essentially come and it comes out your, your inductor structure that we want that you can 3D print. Uh, uh, but like, that's not enough like, for what we want. What we need to do is actually also uh, study uh, like we, we put the same like the models into a EM simulator such that we can actually know where all the fields, the magnetic and electric fields are, such that we can actually predict all the uh, all the parasitics and all the uh, leakage fields that we may have in the structure. The reason is because like we're not interested in printing a component. Uh, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. We want to actually 3D print converters. That essentially you need a converter, you just hit print. And, uh, and essentially just, just prints all the, all the passive structures required for your design. And in order to do that, you have to be able to uh, simulate all the fields. Uh, uh, but it turns out that this structure, again, even though it's much, much better as I showed before, it's still not perfect. And the reason is uh, there's two components for inductance in this structure. One is the number of turns that form the inductance in itself. And there's another component that is minor that is actually, it's because uh, the current as it comes into this terminal, it makes its way around the circumference of this path to actually come back out and like kind of on the same position. So the fact that the current has to go around that way defines a loop that produces uh, a circumferential inductance that produces a magnetic flux that goes within the magnetic, uh, uh, I guess, it will go in the, in the C, -ax, uh, C axis from this structure. That is actually important because if I want to realize that vision, that we want to make a structure that is within uh, an, an other structure that has metallic parts nearby, 
if you have um, a metallic shield nearby a structure like this, that one turn flux will essentially induce eddy currents and produce extra loss that we, we, we don't want to do that. But it turns out that 3D printing, we can actually eliminate. So what we, see, what, what we did is actually borrow a trick that is using high voltage transformers. You can imagine that in a high voltage transformer, you don't want the terminals to be very close to each other because that's just a weak point in a very high voltage design. So what, what they do is uh, they put a structure that have the terminals on opposite side to, to prevent issues like that. But like we designed this structure such that essentially we, we, you can think of this as having two inductors in parallel, but each inductor throws the magnetic flux in opposite direction such that we cancel that circumferential inductance that, we, that, that can have potential for uh, causing some trouble. So, uh, so we, again, we, we can import it into, the, into a EM software and, and uh, verify that effectively we're canceling that component of flux that, that, uh, we, that we don't want. But like the reason that I'm showing you this is, so this is structure uh, has the benefit uh, compared to this structure that does not have an external magnetic field that can couple with nearby structures. But uh, the same way that I can use two strings in parallel to form an inductor, uh, using the capabilities that you have in a 3D printing, 3D printer, you can also start cr creating other kinds of shapes that you're not able to create with a planar structure. So you can start thinking, you have to think three-dimensionally now. And like the rules become very different. We're still exploring, I wish I could. Uh, but, but we're able to create these structures that essentially uh, we can predict all the parasitics that we can actually connect together to hopefully eventually uh, uh, create like essentially a 3D printer, 3D printed transformer. So uh, I, th this power supply is, uh, I believe, 300 watts. And uh, the, the, the size of the inductors is much bigger than we want. And the reason that they are bigger is because uh, we didn't make them ourselves. We actually use a 3D printing online service that prints jewelry. So, uh, so like uh, they print in gold and silver. So that's why we made them in silver. It's not that we have a lot of money. It's, it's that like for them it's jewelry. And uh, so, so we can... It's cheaper, yeah, it's hearing. But in reality, in reality, what we would like to do is actually at the frequencies that we're operating, all the current only flows through a tiny, tiny layer on top of it. So like all the metal, all the silver is unfortunately not used. All the current goes in a very thin layer. So we actually, what we want is actually 3D print parts that are made out of plastic and then just electroplate, I don't know, 15, 20 microns of, uh, uh, of, of, co of copper to actually uh, uh, infuse them with the, magnet, like the, the electrical properties that we want. And that essentially would mean that we can make a very, very light uh, a power converter because there's exciting applications for that. But not only that, still not perfect enough. So I showed you, I showed you structures that like use a circular cross section uh, for a toroid, which is much better than a square structure. But it, can, it shows us that you can actually mathematically prove that the perfect shape to reduce the loss in a, in a, in a toroidal structure is actually look like this. It's like a, a fat D. And uh, if you've ever seen a, a nuclear tokamak, you can see that they actually have that shape. And one of the reasons is because it's an optimal shape for, for, for the fields that are producing those, those systems. But it turns out that 3D printing those structure is actually trivial now. I mean, it's not, <laughs> if you ask my students, it's not trivial, but <laughs> it's a, 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 like it, it makes, for, for the 3D printing process, it takes no effort to actually print more complex structure that you were able to design before. And we're just levering the, fa le levering the fact that uh, when we're operating in the frequency regime that we're operating at, we don't need to use any uh, magnetic material to speak of. And particularly the area that I'm uh, very interested in is trying to make uh, high voltage power supplies because the possibilities that the opportunities that we have to, to have very interesting applications are very interesting. So for example, here is one power supply that we built that is able to produce uh, high voltages of uh, about 2000 volts in very, very short pulses. And the reason that we want to do that is that here comes the applications. Uh, this, this high frequency power supplies 
uh, will allow you to make, uh, for example, an induction heating system that, like we have demonstrated already, that operates at 13 megahertz. It achieves an efficiency 93% using silicon. And uh, it's about this big. It's very, very dense. That actually we can take to say uh, to about 1.5 kilowatt using gallium nitride devices. But uh, another advantage of using uh, air core devices is that we can use, uh, because we don't have a magnetic core, we don't have the Curie temperature limitations of normal ferrites. So that means that we can operate it, operating in situations that can be at very, very high temperatures. Like, we don't have a Curie, a Curie limit, so we can actually heat our uh, inductors super hot, and that's important in applications that you want them to be hot like some space applications that I'll show you. So for example, another, another benefit of using air core structure is that you can start placing converters where you currently can't, like for example, an MRI machine. Right now, if you've been in an MRI machine, uh, all the power supplies are located in a room that is far away from where the machine is. The reason is that if you put it nearby, this is what happens. So this is, uh, it, any metallic structure gets sucked into the magnet, and that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Patients usually don't like that. <laughs> so, so, the, the, uh, the, so the, the, the power supplies always have like magnetic uh, inductors and ferrites that would not only saturate uh, in the magnet, but it actually become ballistic. And, uh, but like the type of power supplies that we can build do not have those magnetic supplies, so we have been demonstrated to be able to work well in, in, in these environments. Another exciting application of high frequency power electronics is the fact that we can make plasma. So, so this is some pictures from uh, the Max Planck Institute that they developed like this uh, uh, therapies that uh, ionize gases, argon particularly, to, to try to, uh, to make a plasma that when it's directly applied to like bacteria, it just, the bacteria just die. So this is a picture of a Petri dish with uh, MRSA, uh, antibiotic resistance MRSA that like, uh, well, just die. So we, we, the, the, the issue with this machine is the size. This is the, the size of the power supply that they use for that therapy. So what we can do, like we, my students are trying to do, is we're trying to figure out ways to actually miniaturize this. So uh, this is uh, the, the former, former finger of my student. And, <laughs> and, and, and we, <laughs> We try, we try to, uh, uh, so my students actually put it together and we actually build a miniature version of this. That essentially we, uh, we with some collaboration with Professor Alexander Ricard at the University of Michigan, we actually tested that effectively it also kills uh, MRSA. And uh, it's a battery operated portable pencil that uh, we can use to like treat wounds. But like this, all this work on plasma, it actually got, got us really excited because we start seeing the possibilities in, for space. So for example, this is a, a tiny power supply that we built that is actually capable of providing like up to like 100 watts of power uh, inductively coupled to, uh, to, uh, to a vacuum tube. The reason that that is important is because uh, right now there is like a, a big effort to try to put satellites, like small low cost satellites, but they currently have no thrust. So when you put a satellite into, sp this little satellite into space, they only last for so long before they re-enter the atmosphere. We, what we want to do is we've been co collaborating with Professor Mark Capelli in, in mechanical engineering in the uh, uh, laboratory for plasma physics to actually try to develop a helicon thruster that actually can fit in a CubeSat, such that it actually develops. Uh, so for example, we actually tested, uh, tested uh, the helicon plasma just the other day. And it's actually able, we were able to actually measure thrust. And then uh, Professor Capelli's student actually me measure ion velocities that can reach 52 kilometers per second in something that it uses only a few watts of power. The reason that this is cool is because we can actually fit, we probably can fit it uh, into, a, in, into a smooth CubeSat. Actually, more than just probably, we actually fit it into a CubeSat. So uh, uh, the possibilities, so the, the cool things about uh, being able to put a thruster, the, this magnitude into, into a CubeSat, is that actually the ISP, ISP the, the, the specific impulse and ion velocities that the, and thrust levels that this, uh, thruster can generate are actually strong enough that it would be able to take this, uh, 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 this satellite into interplanetary space. So like the question is, where do we go next? And I say, Mars. 
So, uh, the, other, the other application is x-rays. So this power supply is what we want to be able to do is uh, make a, a, a small portable x-ray por uh, source that can reduce the amount of radiation that patients are getting irradiated with and it's not needed for, for, for imaging. But also we envision probably making portable power supplies, uh, sorry, portable x-ray power supplies that can be used to ionize uh, gases for other scientific applications. And uh, another exciting application that we've been recently working on uh, and funded through the Tomcat uh, Center is like to, to use these very high uh, voltage power supplies that we're developing to, uh, ultra, uh, to, to do a process that is called pulse electric field sterilization, that by applying very large fields across a liquid, you can actually rupture the cell membranes, the bacteria membranes, to actually render them non-viable. So essentially what it means, you can sap water to uh, kill bacteria in it. You can actually pasteurize uh, water with, a, with a achieving efficient uh, reductions in, uh, in energy from normal thermal pasteurizations that are about 95% in water, like, like when you're doing this in water. And you can actually save about uh, two times what you, what you used to uh, thermally pasteurize milk. And uh, we just started to do testing like, uh, right now. So for example, here on the back, uh, we actually take water from a pond and we uh, uh, treat it with these pulse electric fields. And you can see that after two days, the one, the, the, the one on the bottom that was treated with these 10 microsecond pulses of uh, 5,000 volts per millimeter fields just didn't develop bacteria. Still very early on, like this is a well-known process, like the, the, the smallest machine that we've seen uh, is, was, you can buy it for $250,000 from Diversified Technologies. But what we want to do is reduce it to the size of what can be like about the size of a Brita filter and, and use very little power. So with that, uh, thank you. This is really back to the future. Yeah. Because it goes back to Tesla yeah. this time, a high voltage, high frequency. Yeah, go ahead. So, very nice talk. So, uh, on the, like the water purification, how does that compare with uh, just uh, UV LEDs? So, so for example, uh, so UV, UV actually works really well, but uh, UV wouldn't work in milk. If, uh, and, yeah, and, that's what I wondered. Is it, yeah, it, so... so uh, it works great in fish tanks. Yeah, it works great in fish tanks, but like, like so, so uh, the, in, like, opaque liquids, like for example, I believe that we could be, we would be able to treat like uh, uh, orange juice, for example, with this pulse electric field process and, and save probably about 75% energy uh, from over thermal pasteurization. This is a, an in, a process that is uh, already implemented in an industrial scale, but we want to do it as something that is very, very compact. And the particular project that we're working with Tomcat like the, my students are trying to put together a unit that can, uh, so we've learned that uh, about 40% of the milk that small farmers produce in rural countries gets spoiled before it reaches the aggregator where they sell the milk, right? So what we are trying to do is a unit that is not trying to pasteurize the milk for human consumption directly, but actually just to kill enough bacteria so that they don't lose that 40% of the milk as they go to the market. And, uh, and we think that has a, uh, nice potential as application. Any other questions? Must be lunch time. Yeah. So the lunch is served in the basement.